I'm Gernot Heiser and I'm teaching this Advanced Operating Systems course. This time, all virtual. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which UNSW is built, the Gadigal people of the Iowa Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Secondly, I would like to welcome the Advanced Operating Systems students from UNSW. Um, they are truly advanced if they've been admitted to this course. Um, advanced Operating Systems has been running for a long time and it's always been very elitist, selective in the students it allows in. And um, they tend to learn a lot. So I hope this year will not be different. It's a real shame that I have to talk to a camera here rather than actual faces, which um, is a challenge. It makes it harder to be really truly engaged if I can't see the people I'm talking to. So please um, give me, cut me some slack on that. And then thirdly, I would like to welcome the wider SEL4 community because these recordings will be made available to the world as a contribution to the growing ecosystem of SEL4 in order to allow more people to learn about SEL4. Of course, this, the lectures of this course is only part of the whole course. There is a challenging project that goes with it. Students build an operating system almost from scratch on top of SEL4. Um, we use a widely available platform, an old droid, and we hope that other people can do the project just as well as the UNSW students. Obviously, the UNSW students get a lot of help from very experienced tutors. Um, the others are more on their own, but um, we provide all the material, so nothing is stopping you from doing what we do here as well. And with that, let's get started. This course is very much about microkernels and in particular SEL4, and the this introductory lecture is going to present an overview of microkernels and a, introduce you to SEL4 in particular and sort of what, what sets it apart from other microkernels before we then go into details of the API and how to use SEL4. And in for the advanced OS students, these first two modules should give you all you need to get started on your project of building an operating system on top of the SEL4 microkernel. Um, because my slides got routinely ripped off in the past, I decided to just um, bite the bullet, put them up as um, freeware, so everyone is legally allowed to rip them off or copy them. But I hope at least that they give me credit as the license requires. So what are microkernels? Fundamentally, microkernels are about reducing the trusted computing base of a computer system. So the, um, the amount of software which needs to function correctly for the system to have any security or safety. So the stuff you need to trust. So the idea of a microkernel is to provide a minimum of platform that is flexible and um, allows is extensible and provide all the or the functionality you expect from an operating system, whereas the microkernel itself provides almost nothing of that. So we see this in this diagram, where on the left, we have a very abstracted structure of a traditional so-called monolithic operating system like Linux, which consists of vertical layers and applications running on top, and all the system servers, or most of them, run in kernel mode. That's the privileged mode of the hardware. And if an application performs a system call, it, um, the hardware traps into the lowest level of the operating system and then um, hence the request up and typically it goes up and down a few times through various layers until the service is delivered and we return to the application. This is in contrast to a microkernel where the, what runs in the privileged mode of the of the hardware, the so-called the kernel, is really only a very minimal amount of software and everything of interest, all the system services you expect run on top. 
and they run side by side between the applications. So from the microkernel's point of view, there's no real difference between an application and a system service. They're just processes isolated from each other and they communicate via some sort of uh, IPC mechanism. And um, the IPC mechanism and memory protection is really what the microkernel mostly provides. The idea of a microkernel is really quite old. It goes back to 1970, so that's 50 years. Um, really an old concept, almost as old as virtualization. And um, the inventor of this idea, the term wasn't coined at the time, was a guy called Peter and Hansen in Denmark. And this paper, by the way, the nucleus of an operating system by Brinch Hansen in CACM 1970, is a very worthwhile mm. read. It's impressive by how it presents the core concepts which still uh, define microkernels of these days. So the important point about microkernels is because every system service is obtained not by tra just trapping into the kernel and getting out, so that's two mode switches from user mode to kernel mode and back, every um, service is obtained by sending a message to a server. So that requires sending the message to the server requires two mode switches getting into the kernel, getting out, plus a complete context switch. And for the server's response, the same thing back. So another two mode switches and a context switch. So compared to a monolithic kernel, where we just have two mode switches to obtain a service in the microkernel, we have four mode switches and two context switches. So there's more overhead. And that means that this IPC over um, operation that performs these um, is extremely performance critical. So this is traditionally was the Achilles heel of microkernels and we'll hear more about that. So um, in terms of evolution, it's interesting to compare the, the two models. So in the monolithic kernel, if you want to add a new feature, you add new services or you extend existing services in the kernel mode. And so over time, your kernel grows and its complexity grows. And this is part of the weakness or the core, really the core reason of the weakness of the system is that your complexity of the kernel mushrooms. And of course, anything that's in the kernel, there's no protection against any, if anything goes wrong. So if anything in the kernel misbehaves, the whole system misbehaves. Um, whereas in the microkernel, but if you add features, for example, you add another file system, a new protocol, network protocol, etc. You just add another component at user level. The kernel itself is not affected. And so we can grow and evolve the system without really affecting the kernel much. And that's the key to the inherent um, stability, reliability advantage of a microkernel that it can remain stable and it has a small code base. The code base difference is stunning. Linux started off once with um, tens of thousands, maybe hundred thousand line of code or so. It's grown into 20, actually 60 million lines of code. So this um, 20,000 kilo lines of code is um, conservative. And in contrast, a microkernel a good, well-designed microkernel is of the order of 10,000 lines of code. Uh, for example, our SEO4 microkernel, depending on the architecture, is around 10,000 lines of code. Others are bigger. Some uh, kernels are maybe 40,000 lines of code. I would claim that's because they're not as well-designed as SEO4, um, but that's the order of magnitude. So basically, you are at least three orders of magnitude smaller and more stable. So that means there's an actual hope to get this thing right and perform as expected. So that's the, the core promise of an operating, of a microkernel. Um, and of course, because you have such a small code base, it's easier to optimize it. So you basically can optimize the hell out of this um, small code base and really make it as fast as possible in a way that's not feasible for something like Linux. And because you can just change and grow functionality by adding things on top. It's more adaptable. And because of the, um, the way hugely reduced number of blocks, it's also more dependable. 
Okay, I mentioned the Achilles heel of IPC. Let's put some data to this. This is data from a paper from 1993 by Jochen Lieke, and um, it shows the performance, the, the cost of IPC, of sending messages between address spaces in the Mach kernel, which was the trendy microkernel of those days. And you can see it starts with 115 microseconds for a zero message and then grows strongly. And um, compare that for the raw to the raw copy overhead, which is the green line at the bottom. And you can see this is tiny. And so not only is there a huge overhead to start with, but actually the mark line grows much steeper than the raw copy line. So something is wrong there. There is huge overhead and the overhead grows with the amount of uh, data you transfer. So something is inherently wrong. Compare that to the then brand new L4 kernel, which is the, the arch, the, the granddad of SEO4. Um, on the same hardware, it had a base IPC cost of five microseconds. And if you compare the two green lines, it's um, the, the cost the, the, the cost grew with increasing message size, still a bit more than the, the raw copy, but not much more. So the overhead is drastically reduced. And um, the base overhead is down by more than a factor of 20. And this is really stunning. You don't see that very often in operating systems that you get a reduction in overheads by a factor of 20. Um, why was that? Liedke did a detailed analysis two years later in this 95 paper in SOSP and basically blamed it on the cache footprint. Mach was too big and his L4 kernel was tiny. It was very much optimized for cache footprint whereas Mach wasn't. And that made the difference in this factor of 20 plus difference in IPC cost. And from this observation, um, Liedke derived this, what we call the microkernel minimality principle. Specifically in his paper, he said a concept is tolerated inside the microkernel, only moving it outside the kernel, it, that is permitting in competing implementations, would prevent the implementation of a system's required functionality. So this is a, a very strong requirement. Anything that you can have outside the kernel, you should have outside the kernel only if something needs to be inside the kernel because otherwise you couldn't achieve the functionality required is it allowed inside the kernel. So that's a very strong statement. And um, strictly speaking, there is no kernel in the world that absolutely satisfies this. Everything is more or less an approximation. And our SEO4 kernel is a fairly good approximation. We'll see later on where it um, violates minimality a bit. Um, as anything in operating systems, there are trade-offs and there are very few things are absolute. And the same um, applies to minimality. But as we found over the um, 25 years since, it is an extremely good driver of design. By aiming for minimality, we managed to achieve kernels that are secure, safe and fast. So. The, the consequence is why the, the reason why minimality is good is, okay, small kernel is easy to port. Um, it's clearly easier to optimize. I mentioned that before, right? If you have a code base of 10,000 lines, you can just afford to optimize the hell out of everything of it rather than um, with a million and million lines of code base where you start. Um, and of course it reduces the trusted computing base and allow, give you hope that maybe we can get it right and even for mathematically prove it correct. And this is also the driver of SEO4. But um, it, it's basically been the driver of um, L4 microkernels for the last 25 years. Some of these things are not necessarily correct because in order to achieve performance, you have to often do micro architecture of op specific optimization, etc. Turns out this is somewhat less important than it was in lead case days. So portability is actually not too bad. But the really important thing is by being so small, we have a small attack surface and therefore um, inherently we have a huge advantage in reliability, security, safety. And this is what 
our microkernel C states are all about. Um, so this is the basic idea. The challenge is to make it fly. It's actually not trivial. You need to be very careful in the API design because you play with very little. You need to be very economic with everything, including your mechanisms. And in order to keep this code base small and minimal, and you need to pick the right design to achieve high performance while maintaining all the other advantages. And um, this is sort of the art of microkernel design of implementation, which has kept us busy for 20 years or so. Um, to put things into perspective, this is how microkernels evolved. We had the first generation, I would call um, the Prince Hansen's nucleus, the zeroth generation. It was basically a prototype. It didn't perform particularly well, etc. It was I never got widespread use as far as I know. The first generation started in the 80s, and the best known exponent of that one is Mach, which we mentioned before for its poor performance. Um, contemporaries of Mach were QNX, which is still around, um, still used a lot in critical systems, particularly transport systems. And Chorus, which um, was, came out of India, was a similar thing. They all about the same, started at about the same time. They all had about the same poor performance. And what characterized this, this is an example of Mach. And there's actually a lot of functionality into the kernel. So there's scheduling, kernel memory management, devices, device drivers were in the kernel of those systems, even swapping and a file system. Mach had a file system inside the kernel to allow it to swap the disk, etc. cetera. Um, and so there is a lot of functionality in Mach. The original Mach had, um, was actually about as big, if not bigger than the original Unix. So not that minimal. And Mach 3.0, which is around this time, late 80s, had something like 300 APIs, um, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, etc. cetera. So it's 180 syscalls, the original one, 100,000 lines of code. And as we say, so 100 microseconds IPC. The second generation was started with this L4 microkernel by Jochen Liedke a quarter century ago. Um, and later systems used it based on the same principles were PyGOS, which is a, a clone of L4 version 2, and Integrity, which is used a lot of in, in defense. Um, that's been basically not cloned from, SEO, from L4, but is based on similar ideas. And um, they were m way more radical in taking functionality out of the kernel. So Jochen's original L4 kernel had no device drivers, definitely no file system or any of that stuff inside the kernel. It was basically scheduling and memory management, low-level memory management, abstracting for page tables, etc., and kernel memory. And that worked well in some ways. And I'll talk in a second about what the shortcomings were of this first generation L4 kernels or second generation microkernels. And, um, but it was way smaller, right? Instead of 180 system calls, seven system calls. Instead of 100,000 lines of code, 10,000 lines of code. Actually, the first L4 was 6,000 lines of assembler. And way faster IPC. We achieved um, with our 64-bit MIPS kernel in 97, a sub-microsecond IPC for the first time. Okay, and then from what we learned, over about 10 years of working with original L4 kernels, we generated, we created then this third generation kernel, SEL4, which was completed in 2009, 11 years ago, and we simplified it even more. So even kernel memory management was taken out, and we'll, you'll get to know and love or hate that. Um, because it, it makes the kernel smaller and simpler, but not necessarily easier to use. We'll see that. We'll have fun. Um, it's system calls. So that when I say approximately three, doesn't mean I because I can't count to three. It depends on what the, how you count is three of ten. But there's basically really only two ways to invoke an object, and then there's a yield system call. 
Um, but there's a combination of some, that's why you actually see more of them. But logically, there's really three. Um, and about the same code size. And um, IPC has become faster, but this is just an effect of hardware being faster. We, our SEL4 kernel is a bit faster than the fastest L4 kernel we had built before on the sort of second generation model. So there is a bit of an improvement, but that's the not so dramatic. The, the ten, fact of 10 here is really the hardware. Um, what really characterizes the third generation is capabilities for access control, for really fine grade access control, really representing the minimal, uh, the principle of um, least privilege and a in the case of SEO4, from the bottom up, a design for isolation. This was meant to be, from the beginning, a, a kernel for highly secure systems. And we'll see the what, what that really means. And the interesting bit really, taking kernel memory um, management out and putting it into a user level code is, um, in a way, the most radical thing from the operating system theory point of view SEO4 did. And as I said, you'll have fun with that. Quick um, review of 25 years of high performance microkernels. Um, depends where you start the line. If the first time L4 was called, L4 was about 95, but there was sort of a gradual evolution from an earlier system called L3. Um, I was done at by Jochen Liedke at then GND, and then moved to IBM, then he became professor in Karlsruhe, and then unfortunately, um, untimely passed away in 2001. And um, this created a line of microkernel. We did the, the first 64-bit one on MIPS, and at about the same time, people in place and did an alpha version. And then we did a few more, um, including the OKL4 microkernel, which was the first L4 kernel with capabilities. Um, that ended up in billions of Qualcomm modem chips, so really mass deployment. And the it, actually, it's an, a, a, this, a fork of an earlier version that ended off, up on the secure enclave of recent iOS devices, so also shipping in the billions. And the last, and in my humble opinion, the greatest of all of them, for some fairly objective reasons is SEL4, which was, you can see there's no errors. It neither inherited code nor APIs from earlier models. It was a complete redesign from scratch based on certain principles, which I will cover later. So why did we do that? There were a number of issues with these second generation microkernels. Um, the they solved the performance issues the first generation had, but there were other things left. So in particular, there were a number of things done really ad hoc, which got to bite us in the over the long term. One is it had a global namespace for threats. The IPC operations were, des were sent to threats IDs as addresses, and that introduces COVID channel, as John Shapiro found, um, which is, was a real killer argument for going away from that model. Um, the, the fact that threats were the targets of IPC also had uh, issues that server structures had to be ex exhibited much more than makes sense. Um, the, the way of having this fixed, this kernel memory pool opened the way for denial of service attacks, availability attacks on the kernel, not a nice thing to have. And the fact that the, it was an ad hoc um, permission model that impacted flexibility. And once we started building complex systems, this is something we really found that um, the, the model was too inflexible. And um, it also has like pretty much almost any kernel I know, a unprincipled management of time, which again, over time, be does as we were starting to do serious real-time systems. SEO4 addresses those and um, mo most of the items in this list are really solved by going to a capability-based addressing and uh, permission model. And the unprincipled management of time we finally solved a few years ago with this new MCS from Mixed Criticality Systems configuration. 
Um, it's not yet the default kernel because it's not quite finished, go, gone through verification completely, but it will so in the near future. Um, but this is the version we're using in this course. So this is the first instance of advanced operating system where we're using this new model, which is really the future of SEO4. And everything I will talk when I talk about the SEO4 API and how to use it, will refer to this MCS configuration, which you'll be using in advanced OS and which will become come the default configuration in the foreseeable future. All right, so far, so much about the introduction. Now, let's have a closer look of, uh, at what SEO4 really is. So, as I said, SEO4 was designed from the beginning with the aim of providing a ultra secure platform. And the design was driven by a number of principles which we had established from prior, prior experience with earlier L4 kernels. The one is, um, and that's not our invention, they have been around for a long time, but we definitely got convinced that this is the way to build microkernels is using capabilities. And a lot of the um, credit for that goes to John Shapiro, who is the designer of another microkernel called EROS for Extremely Reliable Operating System. He really strongly influenced the SDL4 community in uh, adopting capabilities, but we had already seen the um, that the old model had used its real by use by date and the move to capabilities made sense. The, the question was really what, more what the model is. Um, originally, capabilities were applied to spatial uh, resources only. We have recently add, in, added time as a resource that's protected by capabilities. And um, this is the core characteristics of the MCS configuration we're using in this course. Um, and the real radical thing, as I said earlier, all resource management, including kernel memory, got taken out of the kernel's responsibility and made responsibility of user level um, policy servers. As I mentioned earlier, it makes the system painful to use, but it really makes uh, it easier to formally reason about, formally and informally reason about the security of the system and avoid a lot of other issues like denial of service attacks, etc. Because it's so painful to use, we shield you in this course from most of this by providing a library that um, hides the kernel resource management and results in a programming model that's more akin to earlier L4 kernels. This is really a reasonable approach, we think, for getting you started. But eventually, you'll need to dig deeper if you want to build real systems that make the full use of the power of SEO4. And the other principle, and this is really its claim to fame, was that it was from the beginning designed for formal verification. We actually started off with the aim of proving the thing correct. And this is something that people have tried to since the 70s, literally, and um, no one succeeded. And it got sort of quiet about it for a long time. And then but with SEO4, we finally pulled it off in 2009. So this is then was the first, the world's first operating system kernel with a mathematical machine checked correctness proof of the implementation. So that's um, really sort of the defining characteristic of SEO4. But um, in terms of OS theory, as I said earlier, the resource management model is actually quite as, about as revolutionary as well. So how does this look like in terms of the uh, abstractions, etc. SEO4 has. Turns out we can sort of fit them on the slide, which is a indication of minimality, if you like. So the, the core concept is the capability. Um, people will have encountered them in an early operating systems course already, but I will explain a bit later what capabilities are. But they are the core of security and um, adherence to the principle of least privilege in SEO4. So they're what used for all reference to kernel objects. And then in terms of kernel objects, we have 10. They grew by eight with the MCS model. Um, so we have threads, which are really in terms of kernel object um, called 
thread control blocks. So they represent execution in this um, or an execution context in SEL4. Then we have schedule context. This is a novelty of MCS, which represent the right to access the CPU. Then we have address spaces. They represent address spaces, protection, memory protection in the kernel, and they're basically very thin wrappers around um, hardware page tables. Then we have endpoints, which are the mechanism through which message passing happens. Reply objects, they are a relative of endpoints that allow a server to reply back to a client without having to carry too much um, baggage around. Notifications, which are semaphore-like synchronization objects. Capability spaces, which are um, which define a process's protection domain. It's uh, a mapping from object IDs onto access rights. And frames, which represent physical memory, which you can map into an address space. The architecture-specific interrupt objects for basically dealing with interrupt controllers and interrupt acknowledgement. And then untyped memory, which is basically unused memory, which can be put to an, uh, any use by retyping it into any of the other object types. So this is, if you like, the, the no, null object type, something you can't use for anything except for retyping it into something else. And besides those 10 systems, uh, kernel objects, we then have system calls and uh, call, receive, reply, receive, which are similar, but the one is the uh, client side and the other is the server side invocation. And there's the diverse combinations of um, one-way variants, etc. of those. Um, but logically, there's really those two. And then there's a yield, and that's it. This is SEO for in a slide. Um, you might think what might be missing here. Um, like what, what concepts don't we have? And um, these are basically all the things we take out. One thing that's not in the list and that's very deliberate is hardware abstraction. A microkernel is designed to be minimal, not to abstract hardware. Hardware abstraction, you can do at a higher level. It's not minimal. It's not something you need to do in the kernel. And SEO4 is very brutal in not abstracting from the hardware, which means, okay, your operating system may not be totally portable between different architectures. But that, as a matter of fact, these days architectures are similar enough that this is not much of an issue in practice. Um, but it's definitely, you see the hardware shining through in several ways. In particular, the our address space abstraction actually has the look and feel of the actual hardware page tables. And if you go, if you compare between um, x86 ARM and RISC V, you will see that the, 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 the they look different in SEL4 because we don't try to abstract the hardware. Why don't we do this? As I already said, it violates minimality. It's got no place in the microkernel. Anyone who puts a hardware abstraction layer in a microkernel, A, doesn't design a microkernel, and B, will run into performance issues. This is something we definitely learned over the decades. And of course, if you abstract hardware, you you provide policy. You reduce, you, you take information away. You need to find a, a lowest common denominator, which prevents you from exploiting the hardware completely. So this is why um, we. It's definitely wrong to try to have hardware abstraction in the kernel. Um, as I said, a true microkernel and SEL four is not. 100% a true microkernel, but the best approximation I know of is just a minimal wrap of hardware. Its job is basically just to do secure multiplexing of hardware. This is a similar idea of the, the concept of exokernels, which um, Dawson Engler and his uh, advisor Franz Kasrock devised in the mid 90s. Um, and the, one of the best characterizations of that was the, done by my former uh, student Chuck Gray, who called the microkernel the CPU driver. And if you think of it that way, then 
it's obvious why it can't abstract the hardware completely. Like a device driver doesn't completely abstract the hardware. There's a difference between different device drivers even in the interfaces. All right. So this is what SEO4 is not or has not. What does it have? Well, for one thing, it has capabilities. I assume most of you are familiar with the uh, concept of capabilities. Um, for those who don't, it, uh, just a quick overview of what you need to know to get started on working with SEO4. A capability is a token that represents the, the right to access op objects and operations in the system. Uh, a capability inherently co consists of two things. There is an object reference and a representation of access rights. So the, if you have a capability, it's like a key that allows you to open uh, a lock to an object. The object it refers to is explicitly encoded in the capability, but also the um, operations you can perform on that object. So if you think of the object being a file, for example, which of course is a high level abstraction that has no place in SEO4, but you might want to build on top, then um, an object, a capability may give you the right to read the object, the file or um, write the file. Um, or it can only give you read-only access, and that's encoded in the capability. And capabilities are truly op opaque in the sense that if I hold the capability, I can't tell what rights it gives me. You need to know, you need to keep track of those things. They're opaque pointers. They're also often called um, fat pointers or implementations of now called fat pointers. Um, and what that means is Every operation in a capability-based system is enabled by a capability. If you don't have capability, you can't do anything. You can't even identify an object in the system. The capability is the object reference, but also your right. And that means invoking an operation in the system is calling a method on a capability. So the capability points to the object and your method is the operation you're trying to perform on this object, and the kernel will check, okay, what object does this refer to? Does this method make sense? Do you have, does the capability give you the right to execute it? And if not, it will clap you on your wack wacky over the years and um, just refuse to perform the operation. The real advantage of capabilities, and this is why they're used in any operating system that is really serious about security is it gives you a very fine-grained access control. I'll talk about this in more detail when I do the, my, the security lecture in a few weeks, um, but the, the real characteristic is access control is per object and therefore really as fine-grained as you can get. And um, that has many advantages, including allowing you to reason about information flow in a system. And this is sort of the core for formal reasoning about security states of systems. In SEO4, capabilities are stored in C spaces. So a C space is a hierarchical data structure, very similar to a page table, um, that contains capabilities. And it, the um, equivalence really goes very far because a page table is a mapping from address, from a virtual address to physical address and access rights. And a similar thing with a capability space. It maps a capability which encodes an object ID, or it, it, con it maps an object ID to an, a capability and therefore the rights on a particular object. Um, <clears throat> so a C space is made up of several C nodes, similar to like a page table made up of individual page tables. And each is an array of slots, which contain capability, similar to a page table being an array of slots, which map physical to virtual addresses. The SEO4 model it makes capabilities inaccessible to user land, so you can never hold an actual capability. You can only hold a reference to a capability. And basically, what appears to um, be a capability is a pointer in this vSpace data structure. 
sorry, C space data structure. And um, it's done by a, an index or set of indices that um, refer to this data structure, which are called C pointers. The, the good thing here, this is actually quite messy to use. The good thing is you don't need to do it because this is typically abstracted in some libraries um, that define the structure and um, the architecture and also security properties of a system. So um, normally user level code, including most operating system code, doesn't have to deal with um, C pointers explicitly. You can have, hide them to a large degree. Um, as I say, capabilities imply access rights and the access rights we have in SEL4 are five, read, write, execute, grant, reply, which is special one for transferring a reply channel to a server in an invocation, and grant, which allows you to send capabilities over a server invocation. And that's it. There's a few operations on capabilities. You can invoke them, which is what you normally do. Any operation you perform in the system, you need to provide a capability to invoke it. Um, for example, if you want to map some frame into memory, you need to have capabilities to both the frame and the address space. If you want to send, uh, invoke a server, you need to have a capability to the endpoint that represents the server. Um, you can't do anything without invoking capabilities. And you can derive capabilities in those three ways to do that, copy, mint, and grant, and they all work somewhat different. So copy gives you another capability with the same rights, mint gives you another capability with, a bit, with lesser rights, and grant is a way to transfer a capability to a different address space. And um, then there is things for, for transferring things from a different place in a between address space, be, between C spaces or within C spaces, things you that's typically only relevant for low level library code and delete for invalidating a slot. So if you have, um, if you delete a capability by pointing to one particular slot in the C space, then that slot gets invalidated. Whether that affects the object behind it or not depends on whether that's the last capability to that object. If there's other capabilities around it will have no further effect other than removing the capability from this particular C space. Um, if it's the last then it will revoke the object and you can directly revoke anything that's derived from a particular capability. So this is the basic idea of capabilities in SEL4 and now let's look at um, what can you actually do with SEL4? So what are the basic mechanisms? And the one that's most important, which you need to deal with all the time, is things that have to do with communication and synchronization. So the two th mechanisms here are represented by uh, IPC and signaling, and they are represented by these um, endpoints and notification objects. So when you hear about IPC, depending on what your experience with other operating systems is, you may think of like a general way to send messages around. This is actually not the right way to think of IPC in SEL4. We should probably be, we'd probably be better off if we had a different name, but this is just historically grown and it's impossible to get rid of it. What IPC really is, it's an invocation of an operation in a different address space. Or protection domain or um, C space. So remember the kernel provides no services, only basic mechanisms, IPC being one of them. The actual OS services are um, provided by servers running in their own protected address spaces and IPC is the way to invoke, invoke such a service. Um, and it's in SEO4, this is done through an intermediate object called an endpoint. So you can send and receive from endpoints and um, what they do is they transfer um, a, a call through without um, any, any intermediate storage, which means that all the arguments are 
uh, transfer it in single copy, so there's no buffering in the kernel. And this is one of the key performance um, improvements introduced by L4 25 years ago. So what IPC is, is already said that it's really invoking a functionality in a different address space. So typically a client invokes a method in a server. And um, the server is represented by the endpoint that's used to send the IPC to. So if your server has a function, then logically it's basically a remote procedure call, right? You invoke a function of that server. And that's what, that's how you look at IPC. So it's um, logically speaking, the client is executing and then it switches address space into the server space, continues executing there in a well-defined code path that's represented by the server function. And then it returns back. And um, while it's executing in the server, it executes with the server's rights. And when it comes back, it executes with the original client side. So it's a, this is the basic concept of a protected procedure call where you execute a function in a different protection domain. So keep that in mind. Don't think of SEO4 as a mechanism for shipping data. It transfers data, but this is ancillary and uh, not the primary purpose. Don't think of them as a synchronization mechanism. It does synchronize, but again, that's not the prime purpose. It's, um, it's a side effect. Really think of SEO4 IPC as this protective procedure call or as um, we also like to say, and this again goes back to my former student, Chuck, uh, it's a user-controlled context switch with benefits. So the context switch is from the client's context, switching into the server context under user control because the client controls when it happens. And the benefits are you pass arguments for and back. As I said, this is this functionality is provided by endpoints. And um, what's behind is this rendezvous model. So we have two threads, a client and a server thread. And um, initially here, the, the server is executing. Um, so we have blocked on the left and running on the right. It's on the right. So there's some code which um, executes until it does this reply receive system call. So this is the server client side IPC invocation. And what it means is it says, okay, I want now to receive from this endpoint and the server gets blocked until something, it, there is something to receive. Typically the assumption is the server runs at higher priority than the client. So now the server is blocked and that gets the client running and the client runs now, it um, executes until it invokes the server by doing this call operation on the endpoint capability, meaning invoking this endpoint here. And this is then when the kernel switches to the server. So we, uh, the client blocks the transfer happens to the server, the server continues executing, and then eventually it um, changes, it, it replies back and unblocks the client. And the server typically at that stage goes back to blocking, waiting for the next operation. So there's an uh, handshake and the two threads do get synchronized, but that's not the, the primary purpose. And you should actually, um, well, I'll get to that later. In order to, if you think of this as the um, function invocation, a function requires argument and it has a return value. And this is what the, the payload of the IPC, what it transfers. So when this IPC happens, then the client provides some message data, which is your function arguments, which the kernel copies to the uh, server in what's called message registers. And um, you can, this argument data can be pure data or it can be capabilities if you have the right to transfer capabilities. And there is some limitations at the moment, 121 words, which is actually way too big. I wouldn't mind reducing that because you never should even try to use that much. Again, think of it as just function arguments. So the way you th should actually think of this, as I said, as a protective procedure call and logically 
not really as two threads. So reality is, yes, you do have two threads, but at any time, one of them is always blocked. Only most one of is executing. And the logic way to put this, to look at it, is that there's only one thread that jumps into a different uh, protection domain. So if you go back and look the the client here, it's executing, and then it does a call, and then the execution continues in the server with a different code base. So this is the function call, and then it switches back and continues the client. So protected procedure call, and it's really a logically a client switching from one address space execution context to the other. Underneath. Um, these endpoints are message queues. So if you think of um, a endpoint as being sort of this way, um, this port through which the client invokes the server, um, then what happens is if the assume the server is um, executing or no, one of the clients is or the, the the kernel represents these by its own data structures. So inside the kernel space, you've got for each of these threads, a TCP, a thread control block, and you get the, have this endpoint data structure. And if, a, if the server is busy and executing and um, a client came along and tried to send to the server, the server is not ready to receive, the kernel enqueues the uh, client TCP in this um, endpoint data structure. And um, then if another client comes along, then it would be enqueued at the end of that. So the endpoint is really a, the head of a queue of um, blocked threads. They can be either sender threads or receiver threads if there were multiple servers queued on the same endpoint then we would have a queue of receivers rather than senders. It can be either, but it can never be mixed because whenever there are, say, senders queued and a receiver comes along, it will all immediately pick the first of the queue and continue executing. Um, so the important thing to take away here is the endpoint has no sense of direction and it can either queue senders or receivers, never the same thing at the same time. And that means for any communication, you typically need two things, either endpoints or something else, because you, the server can't just reply through the same endpoint because its um, reply might go to a different client. It might pick up its own replies, etc. So you, you really need to have a discipline which defines who are the senders and who are the receivers on this endpoint. And typically that's um, represented by capabilities. This is a somewhat artificial example, at least for a single core, because generally you don't really get any queuing. If you think of a server being the highest priority thing, or at least being at higher, running at higher priority than any of its clients, then you would actually not get clients queued. Um, you could only have the, the server queued if for some reason you want to support servers with long running operations which can block then you might have multiple servers which can queue on the endpoint um, but in a well-designed system you actually don't have queues building up in that sense it also doesn't matter that the queues tend to be 50 or whatever okay so this is the, the the basic idea but how do we efficiently implement these server invocations the remote procedure call the thing is that um, the relationship between clients and servers is an asymmetric one because the server is typically widely accessible. It, it's often well known, but typically it has multiple clients. And whereas clients are sort of private things, right? They, they do their own thing and occasionally invoke a server, etc. But for security reason, they should be able to remain anonymous as the server, I shouldn't really have to know on whose behalf I'm operating, provided the client presents the right credentials to me to perform the operation. And in particular, if a server has many clients, when the client comes along and um, makes a request, how does the server know where to reply back to which client? You need a protocol for doing that. 
And in general, of course, that's true for anything, right? Any communication always needs protocols. You can't communicate without protocols. So a naive way to do that would be to have a session capability. So the client creates an endpoint, passes it and its requests along to the server as the way to communicate back. And then you have um, a session which may be short or long lived, but it allows, it gives the server some identi identifiable token to reply back to the client. Um, this sir, forces a stateful design on the server, which is not necessarily a good idea. Um, and um, it has uh, another set of drawbacks. The clients need to either create endpoints all the time and delete them. That's a relatively lightweight operation, but it still costs. Um, or they have to recycle these endpoints, in which case a server might just keep hold on to it and um, interfere with other client operations. If the client tried to use the same endpoint for a different server, then the original server could still use it or something. Uh, you get into messy protocols and also inefficiencies. So what we have in SEL4, and again, this is a, um, a no, bit of a novelty in the MCS kernel you're using. The earlier SEL4 kernel had a somewhat different model. It's, it's, there, there's some similarities. Uh, it still had this way of creating a, a reply path, but it worked different. So what I'm tell, talking about now is how things work in the MCS kernel. Um, so in this kernel, this, the server actually, in, for the interaction, uh, replies what's called a reply object. And the, when the client invokes the server, the kernel establishes enough state in this reply object that the server can just use this to reply back to the client without requiring a separate endpoint. And um, so the reply object is something the server provides. The client, the kernel connects it to the client when the client has invoked the server. And it can then, the server can reply back to the client, but only once. It can only use this reply state once. It gets invalidated once the reply has performed. And then this, the client is safe from the server. It doesn't need to create a new endpoint each time. Um, it can operate anonymously. And um, so the way this works is you now have two objects to communicate with between client and servers. And this is consistent with, I said, with what I said earlier is that you need two things. A single endpoint is not enough, but the client actually only sees the endpoint. The return object is something that's private to the server. What the client has is a capability to this endpoint so the client has the orange capability, which refers to this orange endpoint. The server also has the orange uh, capability for the endpoint, but it also has this um, yellow capability that refers to this uh, reply object. Uh, the, the server go, get, goes to block on this endpoint because it's ready to receive a um, invocation from the server. This is the reply receive system call. And um, the, at this point is actually only the receive phase. We assume there is uh, some initialization process before. And so the, the server is blocked and now the client starts executing and it gets eventually to the point where it invokes the server, perform this call operation on the endpoint. And now the kernel um, transfers the, the payload of the IPC to the server unblocking the server in the process, but um, retaining this client state in the reply object. And the client is actually now blocked on the reply object. So there's a reference in the client to this reply object that says it's blocked on this one. It can't keep operating until it gets unblocked or the reply object goes away. And now the server executes, it does its processing, and then eventually replies back, providing this same reply object again. So you can see in the two calls have obviously the same signature, there's the same procedure call, and you see the reply object is used in two ways here. On the receive phase, that's the initial one, 
the reply object is used to set up the reply channel back to the client. On the reply phase, when the kernel uh, server replies back, then it points to this reply object as this tells you which client to return to. And so the kernel delivers the result to the client, unblocks it, invalidates the state in the reply object. The server is now waiting in the receive phase of this system call, basically being blocked until the next request comes in, which then reuses this reply object to, um, to store the return channel. So this is the basic idea of how SEO4 IPC works. Right. So the idea of the reply object is to give you a easy way to implement this client server communication where by just providing a single endpoint, that is the request endpoint for clients, um, the server can use the additional return object in order to basically temporarily store the, the state that's needed to return back to the client and refer to the client. Of course, the server can have multiple reply objects. If it has long running operations that um, require it to suspend operating on behalf of one client, then it can basically keep this return object there while it then goes back to replying to, uh, to receiving a request from a different client. For, if the server does physical I.O., for example, this may be needed. But this gets us to another problem. If you do something like that, then you have a stateful server. If you think of a file server, it returns client state, the, the concept of open files, etc. So how does the server identify such client state? If it, the server has multiple clients and these clients have some sort of a session to the server and the server holds state on behalf of those clients. But the client, all it does is anonymously invoking an endpoint. So if the client does its second or third operation, how does the server connect the client request to the state it has from earlier calls kept on behalf of the client? Um, so we need a way of associating incoming requests with state that kept to the client so we can find the right client state again. This is um, what we support in, well, a, again, there would be a naive approach that you need a separate endpoint for client. So the server could have a general endpoint for opening a session. And then when a client comes in, it creates a new endpoint for each client and then uses that endpoint from then on for communicating with the client. This is, even though creating endpoints is a light, relatively lightweight operation, that would be a lot of overhead, difficult bookkeeping, but it would definitely impose extra overhead on the system. Um, and it's not necessarily, we, we have a better solution for that uh, by having this concept of batched endpoints. Batched endpoints are ways of batched endpoint capabilities, really, are ways to identify a client in a way that doesn't really break the anonymity. What the, the client gets is a batched endpoint. For example, the idea of a, cl a client could um, have a particular version of an endpoint capability that only allows it to initiate a session. And then the server say, okay, this is a new session. I create a new client ID. He doesn't really know who the client is. The server only knows that this is a new client and I give it an ID. And it uses this ID to create a derived capability of the original endpoint, which is client specific. So rather than creating a new endpoint, it only creates a new capability for the same endpoint that identifies the client with this batch. So the batch is basically a bit pattern that identifies a client. And so the server creates a batched version of this endpoint, hands it back to the client, and it can then use the same batch to, as an, to identify 
the client state. And when the client invokes the endpoint with this batch capability, the server is delivered back the batch and can use that to identify the state. So the idea is for different clients, we use different batch endpoints. I um, represent this as these little triangles that are tagged on the, the capabilities and the client state is basically tagged with the same badges. And um, the, when the client involves the capability, the, um, the badge is transferred to the, client, to the server and the server then says, okay, this is the blue client, we use the blue state. And um, then it responds back and then if the pink client um, invokes its capability, the server knows it's the pink state. Um, and that, that's enough to identify state with clients or match state with clients. Um, and that's really the core functionality of IPC provided in SEO4. I have a little bit a look at sort of the, the lower level details because you need to understand them to um, perform, to, to build things on top of SEO4 even though a lot of the, this is hidden away in libraries. So we, as I said, the IPC is a way of invoking functions. So you need to um, pass arguments along. And this is done by having what's called message registers, which are virtual registers in the sense that they um, they may be like physical registers, that they may map to physical registers or map to just memory. And the reason is that some hardwares have very little limited amount of physical registers and therefore that's insufficient to provide enough functionality. For example, 32-bit x86, um, we have only one register left that we can use for passing messages. That's not enough. So we in uh, introduces abstraction of virtual uh, registers, which are um, registers in the sense that are they treated like thread state. So they're like your physical registers or other thread state that's hidden from the user. That's part of being of the state that's getting context switch when the um, kernel switches from one thread to the other. And um, it, as I said, they're either mapped onto physical register or thread local memory. And these are used for transferring the actual IPC message. And um, then, um, as I said, library hides the details and you don't really need to worry too much about that. The, the thing to keep in mind though is, as I said earlier, you should think of these arguments as function arguments and therefore not really pass bulk data, just um, a few bytes, uh, a, a few words, or maybe a dozen words or so older, but no longer big, no bigger than that. And in many operations, the kernel, or actually in all operations, the kernel interprets at least some of that message. And um, if it's a pure server invocation, then there's very little the kernel interprets from the message, but then there's kernel objects you can invoke as if they were um, the servers, uh, where then the kernel imposes more of a protocol for what kind of contents uh, information is passed in those messages. In general, um, the first word is what's called the, the message tag. And um, this, you can think of this as like the operation field that um, indicates what operation needs to be done. And then there is um, up a number of further message registers you can use for passing arguments. And what kind of operations can you do with this IPC? Well, the, we already saw there is a client side call and the server side re, reply receive operation. So the call consists of a send and a receive phase invoking the server and getting the result back. And um, the important thing here, it's atomic. So the switch from the send to the receive phase happens atomically, meaning it cannot be preempted. 
which is really important because if you think of a client running typically at lower priority than the server, then the client, if it once it performs the send to the server, the server starts running because it has higher priority. The client would now be preempted and would be blocked before it gets into the receive phase of its um, IPC operation. And the server could not actually reply back to the client because the client is still blocked. So the server would first have to block and then the client may be the highest priority thing and may be able to get to the point where it can receive and then keep on operating. And then it would immediately preempt it again because then the server is unblocked. So we get a lot of inefficiency. So it's really important, this property of having the, um, the call operation switch from its send phase to its receive phase atomically so that server A can operate with a minimum amount of context switches, but also it knows that when it's replying back to the client, the client is actually ready to receive. And um, there, there, there's important implication of that, which um, I won't go in right at this time. But it also, say, as we said earlier, it sets up the server's reply object, so that allows the server to reply back to the client. And then there's the server side reply receive call, which again has a send and a receive phase. In the receive, that's the reply. It uses the information in the receive object provided by the server to um, switch back to the client and make unblock the client. And then it immediately switches to the receive phase, which is the server blocked again on the endpoint, waiting for the next message to, to come in. And typically this will block the server because as I said, you normally design the system so that the server runs at higher priority than its clients. So once it finished executing and um, it will not have any more work to do because no other client could have been running while the server was executing. And so only after the, the client gets operating again, then some other clients or the same client have a chance to invoke the server again. So typically the server will block at this point. And um, once the receive happens, the system, the kernel will reinitiate the re this reply object with the link back to the new client. And then there is one way versions of this one which are typically only used for setting up communication, initiating uh, communication protocols and exception handling. And you should never use them alone. And in particular, you can't deal with reply objects, for example, by just having send and receive only object uh, operations. So the call operation as well as uh, reply receive, they cannot be simulated by a combination of these um, one-way operations. So what we have is receive, which um, allows you to receive from an endpoint, obviously, reply, which is using the receive object to reply back to the client. And um, then there's a send on the operation, which is basically not useful. It's there mostly for historical purposes, uh, reasons, and maybe some very special cases. You should never use it. And then there is non-blocking versions of these. So there's an NB send, which is a, a polling send operation, which is really mostly not used on endpoints, but on, um, a, on, on notifications, which behave in some way similar to endpoints. We'll see the later on. The NB send is rarely useful on a, a endpoint. There are some specific security cases where you might want to use NB send to avoid a back channel. Uh, the interesting bit is it's because it's polling, it will either deliver the um, message or drop it silently on the floor, which means uh, if there's no one ready to receive when you do the NB send, the message will not be delivered and you will not find out um, because this would really um, create a back channel. But uh, um, you should not have a need to use that, I think. All right, so these are the basic ways of doing IPC in SEO4. Um, the next relevant thing is the notification objects, which are 
synchronization objects. So notifications, think of a notification as an array of, semaph of binary semaphores, because they behave very similar to those. Um, so the, a notification is a pure synchronization object, as semaphores are, and there's three operations. You can do them, you can signal, you can poll, and you can wait. So wait and signal correspond to the classical semaphore operation. Poll is a non-blocking form of wait. So basically, you can poll a notification to see whether it has been signaled. And if not, then you just continue with a zero result. Underneath, a notification has what's called a data word, which is basically these binary semaphores. So it starts off zero. And when you signal a notification, that's done typically with a batch endpoint. So notifications have also, uh, sorry, a batched capability. Um, notification capabilities also have batches. And unlike endpoints, which can be quite useful without batches, uh, notifications are typically quite useless without having batch capabilities because they tell you which of these semaphore-like bits to turn on. So the what the kernel does when a notification is signaled, it simply ors the batch field of this capability onto this data word that represents the notification. And if something was waiting on that notification, it will then get delivered this bit field, bit pattern, and it will be reset while the um, formally blocked thread is continuing. If a block was polling, then um, again, it will receive the bit field and the uh, capability, sorry, the, the bit field is reset to zero. So the semaphores can be signaled again. Um, a very frequent use of signals is actually like set binary semaphores. So you have a batch where only a single bit is set, but you can have more complex batches. The important thing is because the signaling operation ors the batch onto whatever is in the data word already, if you have um, batches with overlapping bits, then you may lose information. And so you need to be aware of that. So waiting returns, and I said something wrong, polling doesn't actually clear the data word, it just returns it. So you need to be careful there. So what, why do we have notifications? Well, because a lot of operations just naturally map onto the semaphore kind of operations. For example, interrupts as a typical example, which are things like that, that are these just single bit things, something has happened. Um, and in particular, they're also useful for, as semaphores are, for synchronizing operations in a multi-core system. Well, Let's assume we have something like a file server. So a file server is something that has clients, implements a file service, and talks to device drivers. For example, it needs to store the files somewhere, so it has a storage driver. And that the typical way of doing this is the client has two interfaces, a client interface, which is a synchronous RPC protocol. So this is the remote, the protected function call invocation the client does on a server. It says, open or read or write is calling a function in the server using IPC through an endpoint. The driver, on the other side, it just signals an interrupt and completion interrupt has happened, something like that. So it has this asynchronous notification interface. Now, how, do, how does the server deal with these two interfaces, the synchronous and the asynchronous one? It needs to respond to client operations, that's its primary purpose, but it also needs to respond to the interrupts coming in from the driver saying that the NIO operation has been completed um, and update its state accordingly. So the naive approach would be to require two different threads for the server. So a thread that um, communicates with clients by listening on the endpoint and a thread that communicates with the driver by um, waiting on notifications coming in from the driver. This works, but it's bad because it forces every server that has synchronous as well as asynchronous interfaces to be multi-threaded and therefore 
implement concurrency control and all that complexity, which is not necessary. It's it actually that was one of the real fundamental design errors in earlier L4 kernels that it forced multi-threaded designs onto many situations where logically there is no reason to multi-thread. So we want to avoid that. And the way this is avoided in SEL4 is that you can bind a notification to a thread control block. So in this case, we, we bind the notification to the server. And that means that if a no, the client, if the server waits on the endpoint, on any endpoint, and the notification comes in, it's actually delivered through this endpoint. So from the server, it looks like it's only listening to IPC, but it can actually receive um, notifications as well. So there's only one wait state in the server, which allows it to both receive client requests as well as notifications from the driver. And of course, the way to distinguish those is by looking at the batch that has been delivered. Okay, so this is a much more elegant and uh, useful way of dealing with this. And before I finish this um, IPC notifications chapter, let's have a quick look at what these messages look like. The message format in total consists of up to four parts, the tags, the data messages, and then capabilities and C space references. And the tag is sort of special because this is what the kernel actually looks at. And so it has some kernel um, enforced semantics. And that's um, the first word of the message. So the first virtual register. It contains four fields of which the kernel deals with three of them. The one is the message length. So how much data is transferred in total. Then, as I said earlier, besides pure data, you can transfer capabilities if, the, if you have the right, the grant right on the endpoint. So if you do that, then this encodes the number of capabilities transferred. And then for the receive side, if you receive capabilities, then there's this unwrap information, which basically tells you um, how many batch capabilities you received. And then the rest of the first word is called the label, basically means this is user defined. So you can use that as an opcode. And this is typically if you implement your little operating system on top of SEO4, you will encode the system call number in this label field. And then the, the rest of the message contains, well, as I said, the, the first the pure data words, and then the capabilities that you're sending or when you're receiving the batches and then um, the C space references where the batches have been are to be deposited. So if you want, if you're willing to receive capabilities, you need the kernel to tell the kernel where in your C space these capabilities should go into. The kernel will not just select an odd place. You will never find it again and this would cause severe security problems. You need to tell the kernel I'm willing to receive, for example, three caps, and cap one goes here, cap one goes here, cap one goes here. Um, as I said, dealing with the C space references is fairly messy, and for this AOS project, you don't really need to do much of that because we hide it in libraries for you. So here's an example of how this works. Um, the client creates a um, message buffer, uh, um, allocates message buffer, loads, initializes it, sets the tag value, sets a actual data value, and then invokes the endpoint to talk to the server. And the server is a bit more complicated. Um, so what we see here is we allocate a, a capability slot and retype some memory into an reply object. We create a, we mint a batched endpoint that gets then handed to the client so the server can identify the client and then um, assume that the, the cl client has this endpoint. The server 
performs a receive operation supplying the endpoint reference, um, a place where to put the badge and the reply object. And the kernel will then populate the reply object when the, um, when the client call comes in and deposit the badge so the server can expect it, inspect it. And then after it's done its thing, the server replies back using the reply object um, to send the message back to the right client.